Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of treating mechanical cofactors um, and the importance or their importance in dorsal cochlear nucleus hyperactivity aka tinnitus and we also have an update from one of our users of the DIY Susan Shore device and how him treating his mechanical cofactors actually helped improve its efficacy. We're also going to be talking about the intracellular mechanisms of long-term depression and long-term potentiation. What actually goes on inside the nerve cells, uh, specifically the synapses and the dendrites, for example, and how tinnitus can actually recover after a temporary spike or how it can persist. So now I think most of you are probably going to skip to the end of the video for the update, but I really recommend that you watch it through in its entirety to understand these conditions better and what can actually help you. Now, let's start with the importance of mechanical cofactors. Now, mechanical cofactors like cervical tension that can be caused by postural issues, like bad posture, for example, sitting at your computer all day, or temporomandibular joint dysfunction. These mechanical cofactors can significantly impact tinnitus and hyperactivity in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Even if these conditions do not cause pain, chronic tension alone can continuously send signals through the somatosensory pathways that interact with the auditory pathways in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. And and this sustained somatosensory input can actually reinforce hyperactivity and make it harder for the synapses or the connections between neurons in the dorsal cochlear nucleus to weaken over time. Now, as I've mentioned, I've had feedback from somebody who was using the DIY Susan Shore device who wasn't seeing much improvement initially. And after listening to my suggestions and addressing his cervical tension, postural issues, and TMJ issues at a tinnitus, um, mechanical tinnitus cofactor specialist, I guess you could call it, or a physical therapist, he noticed a significant difference. This adjustment that he got, or these adjustments that he got, uh, weakened the persistent reinforcing signals to the DCN, allowing the device to work more effectively. And as I've said before, I will provide a full update on his progress at the end of the video. Now, on another note, um, I've already mentioned the importance of keeping a stable environment or intracellular environment. And some other cofactors, like, for example, mm, the impact of medications like benzodiazepines and antidepressants. Now, these medications can actually disrupt the delicate balance needed for effective LTD processes. Uh, these drugs interfere with GABAergic and serotonergic systems, aka GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter I discussed in my previous video, and serotonin, which is actually very prevalent. I mean, the receptors are very prevalent in the DCN itself. Now, the altercation of the neurotransmitter environment um, actually makes it harder for the brain to stabilize neural circuits. And for anybody who's trying to manage their tinnitus, aka reduce the DCN hyperactivity, it's actually absolutely crucial to minimize these cofactors to create a stable intercellular environment that supports these natural synaptic processes, or not so natural, for example, with the usage of the Susan Shore device. Now, we already talked about NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors and their importance in the synaptic plasticity or the synaptic degradation or reinforcement, which either worsens tinnitus or makes it better. Now, I could, of course, give a small description of what uh, these are, but I would recommend that you watch my Lanier versus Susan Shore device video to understand this even better. Now, to give a 
brief description again. Basically, the AMPA receptors are responsible for the initial depolarization process that happens when an action potential travels from a presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron. If there are less AMPA receptors, uh, there's a lot of them here and less here, then the depolarization process is actually weakened. Ergo, the nerve signal, I guess, can not as effectively transfer from one neuron to the next neuron if there are less of these receptors. Now, if there are more of them, for example, after LTP, then the hyperactivity can actually become even worse. As you can see here, we can see the calcium influx into the cell, and actually the cell has specific mechanisms that we're going to be discussing that track this calcium influx and adjust the strength of the synapses accordingly. Now, more about long-term depression or synaptic weakening. Long-term depression can be triggered in two main ways. A low sustained calcium influx. If the postsynaptic neuron experiences a low sustained level of calcium influx, in other words, uh, lack of action potentials or strong action potentials, or a lack of stimulation, ergo if a person is in silence if we're talking about noise, this activates the enzymes that lead to synaptic weakening. Now in spike timing dependent plasticity like the Susan Shore device works, if the postsynaptic neuron fires before the presynaptic neuron in a repeated pattern, two things happen. There is a low calcium influx, uh, and there is also no glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter, bound to the NMDA receptors at the dendrites. And uh, this happens because the, well, the presynaptic neuron hasn't fired to release it. And this lack of glutamate binding combined with the low calcium influx signals that the connection is not important or that the connection is desynchronized and should be weakened. Now, both pathways, as I've mentioned, activate specific enzymes, particularly phosphatases, like protein phosphate 1, as you can see here, and it also activates calcineurin, as you can see here, which lead to the weakening of the synapse. More on that later. Now, the activated phosphatases, like activated during low sustained calcium influx or with spike timing dependent plasticity, Susan Char's device, they begin removing phosphate groups, also known as dephosphorylation, from the AMPA receptors and from the scaffolding proteins, as you can call it, that help anchor them to the synaptic membrane. Now this dephosphorylation actually makes them more likely to be removed. Now, if the scaffolding or the anchoring is weakened, then the AMPA receptors are internalized or they're pulled away from the synaptic membrane. They are then stored in the cell in small vesicles as you can see here. Now these vesicles carry the internalized receptors to compartments known as sorting endosomes inside the cell. Now what happens inside these sorting endosomes? Uh, the decision to recycle or to degrade. Now if the receptors are recycled, they actually return to the synaptic membrane, reversing the effects of LTD and restoring synaptic strength. Now if degradation is chosen in the lysosomes, uh, the receptors are sent for degradation and they move from the sorting endosome to the lysosomes. And when the um, and when the AMPA receptors reach the lysosomes, different enzymes actually break them down permanently, making LTD, well, more permanent by preventing these receptors from returning to the synapse. 
Now, why do these receptors sometimes return to the synapse? Uh, well, this happens if the neuron later needs to increase excitability. Uh, this can happen, for example, mm, I guess during LTP, or when more uh, neural signals are sent that kind of signal the neuron that these AMPA receptors are needed after all. Now we're going to talk a little bit about long-term potentiation or the strengthening of synaptic connections or also tinnitus worsening. Now, as I've explained before, long-term potentiation happens with high rapid calcium influx that occurs with a lot of action potentials that occur. Now, this calcium signal activates specific enzymes, uh, primarily kinesis and um, protein kinesis, which you can actually see on the diagram right here. And this promotes synaptic strengthening. Now, the opposite is actually happening. The um, phosphorylation of AMPA receptors and associated proteins happens. Now, the activated kinesis, they actually add phosphate groups, phosphorylation, the opposite of dephosphorylation, to the AMPA receptors and uh, also their associated proteins. And what this actually does is that it stabilizes the receptors at the synapse and makes them more likely to remain anchored and not removed. This also actually makes them more responsive to the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate, which increases the excitatory response. Now, in response to LTP signaling, additional AMPA receptors are actually inserted into the synaptic membrane. As you can see here, there's quite a lot of them. This, of course, strengthens the synapse, allowing for a larger response to presynaptic glutamate being released. Now, these new uh, receptors are often delivered from intracellular stores, as you can see here. Um, which can actually increase synaptic response without the need for immediate synthesis of receptors. Now, for LTP to be long-lasting or a permanent tinnitus spike, the cell may produce new AMPA receptors and synaptic scaffolding proteins that stabilize the changes. Uh, this includes the production of proteins like PSD95 that help anchor the new receptors in place, ensuring that they remain active at the synapse. And by the way, kinesis also uh, phosphorylate the scaffolding proteins, which actually reinforces the structural support of the synapse, making LTP effects even more stable. Now, over time, the cell regularly recycles and replaces AMPA receptors to maintain synaptic stability, and in a strengthened synapse due to LTP, the recycling process tends to favor maintaining or even adding receptors, which keeps the synapse strong or the tinnitus more severe. Now, the degradation of AMPA receptors, like in LTD, is less common after immediate LTP induction or a tinnitus spike too much noise, too many action potentials, as the cell is actively maintaining a high number of receptors at the synapse. So basically, this is why, uh, for example, tinnitus spikes can be temporary or can be permanent. Permanent tinnitus spikes actually occur when there is um, long-lasting LTP, uh, what I described earlier, basically the synaptic scaffolding proteins stabilize the changes and they actually prevent the AMPA receptors from going back into the cell. So that's what happens with a permanent tinnitus spike. And with a temporary tinnitus spike, uh, the AMPA receptors can potentially temporarily be increased like here, but then when the uh, when the action potentials, or the nerve signal, you can call it as well, stabilizes, these AMPA receptors can actually go back into the cell, causing the tinnitus to actually go down. Now, what do we understand from this? More action potentials, or more tinnitus uh, spikes that occur from increased action potentials, can potentially induce LTP for long periods or long-lasting changes, which means that the tinnitus spike will be permanent.
And this actually can depend on the level of severity that a person has. The more severe a person, the higher the action potentials, the strengthened, the more strengthened they will be, the more synchronization will occur, and the more permanent amper receptor insertions will actually happen. Now I'm going to put up onto the screen uh, a full description of this process, both for LTD, long-term depression, and for LTP. This is basically everything that I talked about, uh, except it's in kind of a easy-to-read format. So you can just read that to understand it better, and we're going to move on. Now back to somatosensory pathway involvement. Um, cervical and TMJ tension or issues uh, can actually exacerbate tinnitus by increasing hyperactivity in the upper cervical nerves that you can see right here, uh, and also the trigeminal nerves, which you can see right here. And these nerves closely connect and intertwine, or they are intertwined uh, with the dorsal cochlear nucleus. And these pathways can transmit abnormal heightened input due to sustained muscle tension or just, you know, cervical instability, anything like that, even without pain. And this increased sensory input actually stimulates the DCN, I guess, indirectly, reinforcing hyperactivity and making it harder for long-term depression to weaken synaptic connections. Now, addressing these cofactors, as I've said in the start, is absolutely essential for reducing somatosensory influence on the DCN uh, or the hypersynchronization. Now, as I said, one user of the Susan Shore device actually saw massive improvement after he addressed his cervical tension and his uh, temporomandibular joint tension or just, you know, the trigeminal nerve. And we're going to get into that shortly. Now I'm going to put up onto the screen the update on the Susan Shore device for one of the users. Now, as you can read, uh, he basically addressed his upper cervical and trigeminal tension, or TMJ tension, which is in that general area. Um, and his tinnitus actually did see some positive effect from this. And even though it went back, he started using the Susan Shore device again, and he saw the volume go down even more. And he actually has experienced silence, so to speak. So this is actual proof that addressing your mechanical cofactors is absolutely crucial, not only for tinnitus overall, but also for the efficacy of bisensory treatment. Now, hopefully you guys also watched my explanations on LTD and LTP, but um, this is another testament to how important and how intertwined the, somatory sensory, the somatosensory system is uh, in tinnitus overall. And that's pretty much it for today. Hope you enjoy these updates and the information in the video. See ya.